I just woke up from a well-needed rest. On our last video, we started constructing our exploit but encountered server errors when launching it. Taking a break cleared my mind and gave me more ideas on how to approach our problem. To summarize where we left off, we are hitting 500 errors from Jenkins whenever we launch our exploit. We tried to replicate some of the headers, such as the chunk transfer encoding, but it was not applied to the actual request. Worst is that our actual payload became malformed. Instead of dividing some of the parts into separate lines, all of them was put in one line. At this point, there are too many factors that can cause those issues. It may be due to the HTTP library we are using, or probably we missed something when analyzing the packet capture in Wireshark. Remember that our goal is to replicate the successful HTTP request from Jenkins CLI. Then once we successfully replicate it and confirm our request is working, that's the time we can add customizations on the script. In order to isolate HTTP library issues, let's try sending the request using raw sockets instead. In this way, we can be 100% sure that we are replicating the Jenkins CLI request exactly without worrying about extra things added or removed from our payload. Sending data through socket module is straightforward. You will see a lot of these on our exploit code, so I will explain it more later. I don't want you to get bored watching me convert all these HTTP requests into Python byte objects, so I converted it already. But don't worry, I will still discuss the process. First is we need to set aside proper variables for the first part of the HTTP request of both upload and download sides. Then another variable for the upload payload. Let's start with the upload side. An HTTP request comprises of three parts. The request line, headers, and message body. Both request line and headers goes into this variable. The message body will go here. To lessen the burden of converting all of these into hex, we can use online ASCII to hex converters such as the one from Rapid Tables. I provided the link in the description below. Once you get the hex values, make sure you terminate them with the proper new line or carriage return. You can always see in Wireshark or Burp if your request is not properly terminated. Lastly, although we can use a more human readable format such as this, I decided to make everything in hex for uniformity and to easily spot byte level issues due to the sensitivity of our payload. Once we have a stable exploit, we will convert this into something that can be easily understood. Don't worry if it is still unclear. Everything will make sense as we go along, and you will understand the reason why we are doing this. Similar with upload side, we also need to prepare the download side. The idea and process is the same. The only different thing is we don't have a message body but we need to make sure we terminate the HTTP headers properly. Before we try these new changes on the script, I want to share another important concept about new line characters. Throughout the series, you will see a lot of this, so it is important to have a basic understanding. New line signifies the end of the current line and the start of the next line. This is different for both Nix and Windows systems. In Unix, Linux, or Mac, this is represented by line feed character, while in Windows, it is represented by carriage return plus line feed. Since we are dealing with a Windows target, Expect to see a lot of carriage return line feed characters. Now going back to the changes on our script, the process of converting everything to hex is straightforward as there are tools that can help you with the conversion. I just needed to terminate each parts of the request properly, but that's not a big deal either. One really nice experience is that I learned how HTTP requests look like under the hood. And of course, that allowed me to fix the 500 error. As we see here, our upload side is successful now. The transfer encoding is set properly to chunk, and our payload structure is laid out nicely. As a result, the Jenkins server returned 200 OK. Now that we confirm our upload side request is working, let's add flexibility to specify any file name we want. But before that, as I mentioned a while ago, we will make our code more readable once certain parts are confirmed working, so let's do that as well. Just ignore some of the comments as I was trying several things also. We will clean them up later. Since we already have a copy of our upload and download side request, I'll just chuck most of them into our variables. Let's put both request line and HTTP headers inside one variable. Then the message body will go into a separate one. Right now, we don't know yet how the session ID is generated, but I'm pretty sure we can replicate it within our exploit script, so let's store that in a variable as well. Let's also use F strings to pass the value. Let's do similar process until we complete our HTTP headers.
our request line and HTTP headers are now complete. We need also to adapt the script to different targets so the host and port are passed via S strings as well. Now let's proceed constructing the message body. Before we test this out, let me explain the other bits. As I mentioned a while ago, the message body for the upload side is similar to the request line and HTTP headers. It uses F string also. This time it's for the target file. After that, we need to combine and convert them into a byte object, which will be passed to the socket, which I will also explain shortly. Well, you might wonder, why didn't I made them a byte object in the first place instead of doing extra conversion at the end? You cannot use F strings with byte objects. Using other kinds of string interpolation, such as format function, won't work either. So the strategy I thought of doing is to make them normal strings first, so I can use f-strings for our dynamic values. Then once the values were passed to the strings, that's the time we can convert them into byte object. Now that we understand the upload side, let me explain the download side. We know that the download side doesn't have a message body, but we still need to put a blank line, so trick is to use these escape sequences, which we learned from the previous section. Although this is commonly used in Windows systems, this is also used in constructing HTTP requests. Now, where is the request line and HTTP headers for the download side? Well, for some reasons, I wasn't able to record that part, but it's on the lines above the upload side variables. Sorry about that. <coughs> Don't worry, it's very similar to the upload side. Only big difference is that they are still in hex format. Lastly, before we try this out, I'll quickly walk you through on the socket code as I promised earlier. First, we create two socket objects, one for upload and another one for download. Sock AFI net means we will target an IPv4 address, while sock stream means we wish to create a TCP socket instead of UDP socket. Once the socket object is created, we will initiate the TCP connection to the Jenkins server. We will also create separate functions for upload and download connections. This will be useful if we want to use multi-threading capabilities later. These functions will receive the socket objects we create. For each function, we will then send the HTTP data we prepared a while ago. For now, let's try to receive the first 1024 bytes returned from the Jenkins server. But we are more interested on the response return during download side, so let's print that. Finally, we will call each function passing the socket objects. Now let's try running the script. We received some data, but it only returns the first few parts of the HTTP request. The output is still the same as the previous testings I'm doing while constructing the last few parts of the script. There is definitely something wrong here because I'm expecting to see more data from the output now that we constructed most part of the exploit. Let's investigate. Looking at the packet capture clearly shows us it didn't work as expected. It looks like the Jenkins server didn't respond to our upload side request as there is nothing here. Looking at this part of the stream, it says we are having issues with extra new lines. At this point, I got into panic mode, so I started to try different things. I started isolating the actual payload into its own variable, but in hex format. This is me hoping I can spot something different, but I still encounter same issue. Next thing I did is source code analysis. That is by forcing an error and leaking the Java class from the Jenkins log. but I still ended up on the same place. Being so desperate, I tried to fuzz and analyze the byte pattern, trying to check what is common and what's changing. I'm still feeling hopeless and about to surrender, but I didn't. The answer is in front of me all along. How did I not see it? If you have been paying attention, you might already know what's wrong with this aside from not getting a response from Jenkins. If you still don't get it, let me zoom a little further. There are a lot of these hex values. They represent a dot. If we compare this to a valid request, we can clearly see that this is entirely wrong. So how did we end up having this wrong payload? Let's go a bit further back in time. On our last video, we got an as key representation of the payload from Wireshark and put it in a text file. Then in this video, we copied these payloads directly into our script. That happened when we try to convert our payload format from hex to strings. We needed to do that so we can use f strings for dynamic values such as target host and target file name. In Wireshark, dots represents unprintable characters, so we shouldn't copy them directly. Instead, we must look at the underlying hex values. Let's slow down a bit and analyze the payload structure. Be sure to pay attention as this is a crucial part of the exploit. From the trend micro vulnerability analysis, Jenkins binary format looks like this under the hood. The whole payload consists of five frames. Each frame contains four parts. 
Let's analyze the first frame. It starts with the frame length, which is four bytes. Do note that four bytes is not the actual value of frame length, but rather it's the amount of memory space allocated to store the actual value. Remember this concept as this also applies to others. The actual value of frame length is computed by adding two to data length. Then we have an opcode, which is one byte. This is equal to zero for the command name and file argument. Next is the data length, which is two bytes. And lastly, the actual data, which represents the Jenkins CLI command. As we see, the data length can be arbitrary. It depends on what command we will use, so this is something we need to accommodate on our script. Our script needs to be intelligent enough to get the correct length of whatever Jenkins command we pass. Now let's go to frame two. This holds the actual target file name and will use same opcode as frame one. Same principle applies to other parts as well. Frame length is stored under four bytes of memory space. Actual frame length value is data length plus two. And data length is still arbitrary as we may pass different file names. Frame three will hold the client encoding so the opcode value is two. I believe in most cases this is set to UTF-8. That means the data length will remain the same for all scenarios. Frame four is the local identifier so opcode value is one. Based from Trend Micro, this is English Canada, but not sure if we need to change it later. Let's take note for now and adjust as needed. Lastly, frame five signifies start of command execution so opcode value is three. We also see that there is no data here because this is the last frame and nothing should follow. Now let's modify our exploit. You can see also here that I put a small note as a guide. This is a summary of what we just discussed. I already started putting some of the frames to save time. Just ignore the commented lines for now as I'm trying different things as well. We already have the first two frames set, so let's continue with the third one. This will be the client encoding. Then let's construct the fourth frame, which is the local settings. For now, let's follow the one in Trend Micro, which is English Canada. Finally, let's add the last frame, which will signal the start of command execution. Let's don't forget to add all these frames so we can pass it to the socket object in one chunk. Let's try this. No error here. Let's go to the Jenkins logs and verify. Our payload is still malformed. Although Jenkins already recognized the actual file name, the read ahead is still blank, meaning there is still some corruption happening. Probably because of this, we are missing an eye. At this point, we experienced a lot of challenges already. We are almost at the end of the finish line, so there is no point in giving up. 